Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our gospel service. We're going to have our time of praise. And the first one we're going to sing is My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness. But just before we sing this, it's always good to look back to know why we're so thankful that we can sing praises on to the Lord this evening. Just going to read from Ephesians 2, and it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, and has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How thankful are we this evening. Let's sing this with praise unto the Lord tonight. My heart is filled with thankfulness to him who bore my pain. Just the same. 
one we're going to sing. We are never, never weary of the grand old song, Glory to God, Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We are never, never weary of the grand old song, Presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine. True and tender, pure and precious oh how blessed to call him mine all that thrills my soul is Jesus he is more than life to me and the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see love of Christ so freely given, grace of God beyond degree, mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All that thrills my soul is Jesus, he is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. <coughs> what a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. Ah, my sin, no red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. Every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see. Strength divine rely. 
commence now our service tonight with our opening hymn on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame we'll stand after the introduction for our opening hymn please <laughs>
Amen. Thank God for that old rugged cross. Paul could say, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's just come quietly tonight. Let's pray together, asking God's help for the meeting and for everywhere else where the word of God will be preached. Great to have Helen McGill with us. We want to pray for Helen too. So let's just come quietly and bow before the throne of grace. Our God and our Father, we count it a great privilege again tonight that we can come apart from all the things that have occupied our time and our thoughts today. And Father, we come now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and bow again before your throne of grace. We come to you, our Father, with gratitude, with a deep sense of our own unworthiness, but at the same time knowing that we are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in all our times of need. Father, we thank you for the earlier part of the day. We thank you for the fellowship that we share together. And we thank you for answering our prayers and blessing us as we met together. But our Father, this is a new meeting. It's another night when we humbly ask for the help and for the blessing of God upon us. We thank you for Helen, who's with us tonight to minister in song, and we thank you for her. We thank you for her ministry down through the years. We thank you for the great blessing that our ministry has been to so many in so many different places. And we're thankful that she's here tonight, and we pray for God's blessing to be upon her. We pray that she might know the help of the Holy Spirit, and we pray, our Father, that not only will we be blessed, but challenged through her ministry tonight. We pray for the reading of your word, and we pray for the preaching of the gospel. Father, we need your help. We realize that we cannot do this by ourselves. We want to know the help of God. We want that the Lord Jesus Christ would be exalted in the midst of his people. We want that those who sit amongst us and who listen in at home on Facebook Live, who do not yet know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, we want to pray, our Father, that this might be the very night when in repentance and in faith they will come and they will put their trust in him. Thank you, Father, for every head bowed in your presence just now. Thank you for all those who've been able to come and join with us. We thank you for those listening in on Facebook Live. We think of those tonight who would love to be here, but they cannot for various reasons. Remember those, our Father, who are in hospital awaiting surgery. We think of those who have come home after a period of time in hospital. We pray that God would bless each one of them and that you would bless their families too. We ask our Father for those amongst us and in our fellowship who mourn at this time because of the loss of loved ones recently. We ask, O oh God, that you would continue to give them the grace that they need, that you would minister to them and that the blessing of God would be their portion. Father, we're conscious that we are not the only meeting that is taking place tonight. We thank you that right across our province, Father, the word of God will be going forth, and we pray for every effort that is made, for every true servant of God, that they might know the help of God the Holy Spirit as they open up the scriptures and preach the glorious gospel of your grace. We're conscious of special efforts that are taking place at this time. We think of the mission out in Scarva, and we pray for God's blessing there. We pray for every pulpit in this land that tonight the gospel will be sounded forth and many will come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. So, Father, meet with us, we humbly pray. Without you, we can do nothing. So therefore, we leave everything in your tender care and we ask for God's richest blessing to be upon us, upon this meeting, 
And we ask it all for your glory alone and in the name of your Son, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, can I take this opportunity to welcome our singer, Helen McGill, to our meeting tonight. It's lovely to have you at our gospel service. <coughs> and may you know the help and blessing of God as you minister in song for him. We're going to ask you now to come and bring your pieces, please. Father's house are many mansions. If it were not true, he would have told me so. He has gone away to live in that bright city. He's preparing me a mansion there I know. Do not shun the love of God from up in glory, or you won't be there to sing redemption story. In my Father's house above are many mansions. If you're saved then to this land, you'll surely go. Jesus died upon the cross to seal my pardon. He died that souls like us may have new life. But I know there soon will come a bright tomorrow when the world will all be free from sin and strife do not shun the love of god from up in glory or you won't be there to sing redemption story. In my Father's house above are many mansions. If you're saved, then to this land you'll surely go. Thank Hal for that lovely piece. Could I take this opportunity to welcome you all to our evening gospel service at Bambridge Baptist Church, 
We welcome those who are visiting with us and those who are tuning in live via Facebook. Pastor Taylor, Taylor will continue the series this evening, Insights from Isaiah. And then after the service, the Youth Fellowship tonight at 8 p.m. through to 9 p.m. And the pickup for the young people will be 9.15. Just the announcements, the incoming week on Tuesday, the toddler group at 10.30 a.m. Then the Good News Club will recommence at 6.45 p.m. in the evening. Also, the Ladies Fellowship, which will be at 8 p.m. And the speaker for the ladies will be Victoria Shields. So all ladies are welcome to that meeting. Also, on Tuesday evening, there is an elders meeting. So elders, please take note that the meeting is at 8 p.m. Then on Wednesday, our prayer meeting and Bible study at 8 p.m. And Pastor Taylor continues the series, The Message of the Minor Prophets. And then on Friday evening, the Youth Club at 7.30 p.m. And that's for all year 8 to year 12 young people. Then on Saturday, the men's breakfast at the Balmont Hotel, meeting at 9.30 a.m. for a 10 a.m. start. And the speaker at that breakfast will be our brother, John Weir. So we need to make sure that everyone who is attending will please sign the sheet in the foyer uh, so we can get the proper people and the numbers so that we can pass it on to the Belmont for catering purposes. The men's breakfast will be at the back of the Belmont Hotel. So if you are going, please park in the top car park at the far side where you will find the entrance to the rear of the hotel. Also on Saturday, the Torch Fellowship at 2.30 p.m. in the church hall and the speakers will be Bessie Thompson and Mary McCarroll. Next Lord's Day, the 6th of October, Sunday School and Bible Class at 10 a.m. Church services running at the usual times of 11.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Pastor Taylor will be speaking in the morning, but Pastor Jeffrey Ward will be the speaker in the evening gospel service, and the singers in the evening will be Heavenly Sunshine. The children's talk next, day, next Lord's Day will be Letitia MacDonald. Children's church will be Donna Atchison and Maureen Irvine, and children's crash will be Julie Bird, Aaron, and Sarah Bowman. The leaflets are now in the hall for the Chris, Christian Siemens Fellowship. I did have one there earlier. I've misled it. But you can collect yours on the way out this morning. It has the full list of all the items that they collect. And if you please have them returned by the 27th of October for Stephen Gamble. Just a note from the treasurers. The treasurers would like to thank most sincerely all those who have contributed so generously to the missionary conference offering. The total amount received was £13,713.75. Pence, your generous giving will continue to spread the gospel to many needy souls. Thanks again, and God bless the treasure. These are the announcements and always made subject to the will of the Lord. We're going to stand and sing another hymn before we invite Helen to come up again. Here is love vast as the ocean. It's always a hymn that I remember. You're standing on the beach, you're looking out over the ocean. And there just seems to be nothing but water. It just reminds us of just how great and how vast the love of God is. It's so unmeasurable. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. We stand after the ocean, but it's <coughs>
final piece, and after that, Pastor Taylor will bring the Word of God. Savior say, thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness watch and pray, find in me thine all in all, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Oh, nothing good have I, whereby thy grace to claim. I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, I'll lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Thank you, Helen, for coming to share with us tonight. I won't say how many years it is since I was preaching and you were singing down through the years, but it's always great to have you, and we've appreciated you coming to share with us tonight. Now, turn with me, please, as we come to the book of Isaiah. We're coming to Isaiah 1 and verse 10. Isaiah chapter 1. And verse 10, and we're going to read through to verse 20. These were verses that we thought about last Sunday night, and we want to conclude our look at them this evening. I went over time a little bit last week, so I'll make sure you're out on good time tonight. So Isaiah chapter 1, and reading at verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands 
I will hide mine eyes from you, yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do well. Seek judgment, relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Amen. We know that God will bless this reading of his word to our hearts. Last Sunday night, as we began to think about these verses together, I said we would do it under a little heading, a sincere plea to a sinful people. A sincere plea to a sinful people. We already know, as we have thought about the opening verses in Isaiah chapter 1, that as far as these people were concerned, they were in a desperate place, but they didn't know it. They were living under the judgment of God, but they just couldn't grasp it. They were convinced that they were all right the way they were, and yet they didn't realize in reality they were far, far from God. And God had every right to move his hand in judgment upon these people because of their sin and their open rebellion toward him. And yet God makes this sincere plea to a wayward and sinful people. Verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What a great statement that is. A statement that comes from the heart of a loving God. They were rebellious children. They were sick with sin. They were spiritually bankrupt. And instead of bringing his hand of judgment out upon them, God reached out toward them in love. And he was willing to reach out in mercy to these people so that they might be restored again to fellowship with God, so that they would leave their sin and so that they would change their ways. And God said, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. See, I love that statement because it gives every single one of us tonight in this meeting hope. These people were wayward. They were rebellious. They were flaunting themselves in their sin in the sight of God And yet here was a God who was willing to save them, a God who was willing to cleanse them, a God who was willing to uh, restore them to himself so that they might know his blessing upon them. You noted last week with me, God extends a loving invitation. Come now, he says. Come now. Let's reason together. Let's deal with this problem of your sin. Let's deal with what has caused this separation between me and between you because something needs to be done. You're living and abiding under my judgment. God says to the people, come now. They turned their backs on God to do their own thing. They sought only their own satisfaction and that was leading them into a life of sin and shame. God says to them, come now. God wanted to reason with them. He wanted to restore them and save them. And of course, that's consistent, isn't it, both with God's loving character and God's precious word. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And of course, God will have all men to be saved and to come on to the knowledge of the truth. It's God who extended this loving invitation to this wayward people. But he said to them, come now, come now. 
God wanted them to respond, to take action. God wanted them to listen to what he had said to them, and God wanted them to stop doing what they were doing, obey the invitation, and come back to God from their dark paths of sin. That's the lovely thing about the gospel. That's the lovely thing about this God of love and grace and mercy that we read about in the Word of God, despite our sin and our shame. There's an open invitation for us, you and me, to repent of our sin and to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we might be saved, that we might be cleansed from our sin, that we might be restored again to fellowship with a thrice holy God. God wants, he's willing, and he's well able to save us. He says, come now. That's the thing about the gospel, isn't it? Come now. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And yet there are so many people, so many people who believe there'll always be another opportunity for me. And they don't see the urgency of God's salvation. They don't heed the invitation that God gives to them week after week through the preaching of the gospel, through the ministry and song of folks like Helen. They just sit on believing that one day they'll sort the matter out and there is no urgency. But friend, I'm saying to you tonight, come now. Come now. If you've gone home and sat down and thought about what we thought about last Sunday night together, I'm saying to you, come now. You're another week nearer a lost eternity. You need to come now because now is the only time that you're guaranteed. And if you don't come now, you might never, ever come at all. God extends a loving invitation. Come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. I want to pick it up there tonight, and I want you to note, secondly, God's emphasis, some important information. God emphasizes some important information. Listen to the remainder of that verse. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, if you come to him tonight, you can deal with this problem of your sin. God wants to deal with the matter of your soul. God wants to do something in your heart and life tonight that will change everything about you. Not just in time but for the whole of eternity. God says, come now, let's reason together, and I will bless you. How? What does God mean when he says that he will rescue these people, that he will deal with them and show them great mercy? Well, let me take this and apply it to your heart and to mine tonight. First of all, God is willing to pardon you as he was those people. Why do I say that? God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Now, you know, from our open introduction, you will note that as far as these people were concerned, they were not only living in sin, they were adding to their sin daily in the sight of God. And God says to them, look, it's time to change course. It's time to take action. It's time to do something about this. It's the same cry as an Old Testament prophet of old who said to his people in a similar state, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Look at yourself tonight. Where are you spiritually? Look at your sin tonight. Why do you continue to live in it? Look at the cross tonight we have been singing about. Why do you continually bypass it? You see, God is willing and waiting to pardon you tonight. He wants you to come now. 
You see, the people in Isaiah's day were living in sin. They were both sinful and stubborn because they had broken his covenant. They would forsaken his law. They were doing their own thing. They were pushing God's patience to the limit. And yet the amazing thing is that not only had God extended to them a loving invitation, but God, who had every right to punish them, wanted to pardon them. Now, let's be clear about this. They deserve punishment for their sin. If you're sitting here tonight and you're not saved, you're sitting at home listening to the word of God and you say to me, oh, well, you know, that's all right for those sinful people, but God would never judge me like that. I don't deserve his punishment. If you're a sinner rebelling against God, living in your sin without any thought of God, I tell you this, the Bible says that you're already abiding under the wrath of God. That's it. Doesn't need much discussion. Instead of thinking that you're the odd person out who doesn't deserve judgment, will never experience judgment, you need to think again. And yet God tonight is willing to extend his mercy to you. And God tonight is willing to deliver you from your sin and to set you free. These people were in a desperate state, yet God was willing to remove their sin and forgive them. He was willing to wash away their sins and to make them as white as snow. He said he would pardon them and forgive them, and only God can do that. But they had to be willing to repent of their sin. And they had to be willing to change their ways. Whatever God says to these people or he says to you and me tonight, I'm willing to pardon you. This pardon implies the removal of all our sin, every last one of them. It implies the removal of all our guilt. It's almost as if God is saying, listen, you're a condemned criminal. In your sin, you're far from me. I should be punishing you. And God's saying, instead of you being a condemned criminal, I tonight can change you and make you a saint of God. That's what I can do for you. I can pardon you. I can wash you. I can cleanse you. You know, it's a wonderful thing to be pardoned, especially when you deserve to be punished. Many years ago in the Isle of Man, there was a governor on the island who received the sentence of death. He had been one of the best governors the Isle of Man had ever seen. But he was falsely accused of treachery by his enemies. He was sentenced to death. And the people who loved him as their governor, they pleaded on his behalf. And a pardon was sent that he might be spared. Unfortunately, that pardon fell into the hands of his enemy. And they kept it locked up until that governor was taken from his cell and then from prison he was executed. He never heard about the pardon, for it was withheld from him. Friend, tonight you'll never be able to say that. You'll never be able to say that that preacher man on a Sunday told me I was a sinner and I was bound for hell and was under judgment, but he told me nothing else. No, that's not true. I'm telling you tonight that if you come in repentance and in faith, that you can be pardoned for your sin, that God will forgive you for all your sins. And God will draw you to himself. You're like a condemned prisoner, like that governor of the Isle of Man. You're sitting tonight in a prison cell and you're awaiting condemnation and you deserve it. For the wages of sin is death. And yet God looks upon you and he says tonight, come now. Let's deal with this matter of your sin. 
Let's deal with the eternal welfare of your soul. If you're prepared to repent of your sin and turn from it, I'll pardon you. I'll wash away your sin, every single one of them. I'll give you a new life to begin with. I'll change your life. I'll change your status. And I'll do something for you that you can't do for yourself. And something that the world outside can't give you. I will do it for you. If you'd only come in repentance and in faith and trust him. Ah, you say, but hold on a minute, John. Tell me this. If you're saying I'm under the judgment of God and I deserve it, and on the other hand, you're telling me that God wants to pardon me, how can that be possible? I'll tell you how he's able to pardon a sinner like you and a sinner like me. It's on the basis of Christ's death at the place called Calvary. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And Jesus Christ went to that cross and he carried our sin with him there. We had an awful burden to bear. The Lord Jesus Christ took that burden, bore it away in his own body on the tree. We had a great debt to pay, a debt that we could never pay. Jesus Christ paid that debt in full. You and I were under the judgment of God. Jesus Christ bore the very punishment that was our due. And he bore the wrath of God for us. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place, condemned he stood. He sealed my pardon with his blood. And tonight I can say hallelujah. What a saint. Can you say that tonight? Your sin's gone, your guilt removed, your life changed. You say, no, but I'll work that all out for myself. No, you'll not. You'll just continue on as you are until the day comes when you slip out into eternity to face the wrath of God when tonight in this meeting you could have been pardoned. Pardoned. You say, ah, but pastor, listen, if only you knew the depth of my sin and the terrible nature of my sin, and you can go on with a list of things about your sin. Well, let me say this, that the Bible says tonight, not the pastor, the Bible says tonight, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Friend, tonight, what a great opportunity this is for you. To come into a meeting like this or to sit at home burdened and weighed down with guilt and with shame and with the sin of your whole life before you. And to know tonight on account of Christ and his death on that cross God is waiting and willing to pardon you. God says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. All of your sins put under the blood of Christ. All your sins cleansed forever. Sins gone. Punishment removed. And heaven awaiting your arrival. God is willing to pardon you. Here's the second thing. God is willing to prosper you. Now, let's be very careful about this because this has absolutely nothing to do with a prosperity gospel that many false teachers are preaching today. Who are these false teachers, Pastor? Well, sometimes to deal with truth, you need to deal with the error. I'm talking about people like Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, 
Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, Creflo Dollar, Paula White, Joyce Mayer. You say, what, Pastor? I listen to some of these people when they're on TV. Don't do it anymore. Stay away from them. They're false teachers. They're prosperity teachers. They're televangelists who have commercialized the teaching of the gospel in our day. And my advice to you is stay away from and reject their teaching. You say, but is it really that bad? Well, you see, this branch of Christianity promises you a direct path to a good life. It's called by many names, but it's called the prosperity gospel simply because it refers to these things. It's a bold claim. God will give you your heart's desire. God will have you have plenty of money in your bank. You're going to have a healthy body. You're going to have a thriving family life, boundless happiness. It's one of the most prominent false teaching movements of our day, and it has deceived millions all around the world. See, here's the thing. I'm doing this now a long time. I know many Christians tonight and many faithful servants of God amongst them and for them, that's not true. Not one of the things I've said to you is true. Because they don't have plenty of money in the bank. Some of them worry and wonder where they'll be when they leave their church because they have nowhere to go. They don't enjoy good health, but they labor on nevertheless. They have to cope with illness like everybody else. Members of their family are not saved. Their homes are struggling with all that life throws at them. They have to pass through times of doubt and difficulty like everybody else. Where's the prosperity in that? Surely the promises are broken immediately. Do you know if you listen to the false teachers and these prosperity preachers, they will tell you that God promises to you a vast material and financial inheritance in this life. And the more you give, the more you gain. In other words, when it flashes up across the screen, you send me 30 pounds or 30 dollars and God will restore it tenfold. And a wee lady sitting in her house with nothing in her purse but the 30 dollars sends it off. And the prosperity preacher rubs their hands and the little lady has nothing left. Child of God tonight, listen. If you believe in what the prosperity preachers are telling you, it will be to the detriment of your faith. So then what does God say to these people? Well, very quickly. He was willing to bless them and prosper them. And he says to these people of old, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. God simply says to these people, listen, if you are willing to repent, willing to take God at his word, not only will you be pardoned, but I will bless you abundantly. What does that mean? Well, firstly, God would forgive their sins. Secondly, God would heal their land. Thirdly, God would restore to them the days when his presence was felt amongst them. And fourthly, God would reveal again his power in the midst that had been taken away because God had withdrawn himself from these people because of their sins. Let me say this tonight if you're not a Christian. That God doesn't only want to pardon you. He wants to bless you. You say, but surely, Pastor, that underlines everything that you said. No, no, it doesn't. I've exposed the error. Now I'm going to tell you the truth. When I say that God is waiting to bless you, I'm talking about spiritual blessings 
that God is willing to bestow upon your life. Firstly, salvation. You can have salvation tonight through faith in Jesus Christ. It's full and it's free. The Bible says it's a so great salvation, but it's not cheap. For the Lord Jesus Christ purchased that salvation at the cross. And there when he took the prisoner's place, he shed his own precious blood to purchase salvation. Secondly, you could be reconciled to God. That's a wonderful thing. Because as sinners, we are estranged from God. We are alienated because of our sin. The moment we come and put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're brought back again to God. We're reconciled to him. Thirdly, you could be adopted into the family of God. It's great to be part of a family. There's no family like the family of God. The Bible says you could be an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Fourthly, you could know his presence with you and his power within you because the moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Spirit of God comes to indwell you. Do you see those dark, difficult days? You have God's help. You can know God's presence. You can know God's power and God's peace. These are all blessings that flow to the child of God. And fifthly, you can be sure of a place in heaven. Not amazing. Sure of a place in heaven. The Bible talks about being delivered from the kingdom of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Friend, tonight without Christ, there's nothing for you really in this life apart from sin. There's nothing for you in a life that is yet to come apart from hell. But through faith in Jesus Christ tonight, you could have heaven. You could be sure of a place in heaven. God is willing to pardon you. God is willing to prosper you. You say, but pastor, what if I don't come? What if I choose to remain in my sin and far from God? What then? Well, God is waiting to punish you. God is waiting to punish you. God was willing, waiting, well able to save these people and he told them so. But then he said this, verse 20, but if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. If they wouldn't accept God's pardon, they were facing punishment. If they wouldn't come and receive the mercy of God, then they were going to face his judgment. If they continue to rebel against God, instead of prosperity, there would be pain. That's something the Bible's very clear about. It says, whatsoever, whatsoever a man shows, that shall he also reap. You apply that principle to your heart tonight and ask yourself some very serious and solemn questions. If God's willing to save you and you won't come, one day you'll be lost. If God is willing to pardon you and cleanse you from your sin, and you won't come. Instead of God's pardon, it will be God's punishment. Do you know what will happen? On the verge of a great eternity, you'll stand unsaved, unclean, 
in God's sight and ready to be condemned for the whole of eternity. Why? Why? Why die in your sin and be lost when tonight you can have your sins removed and be saved and be sure of a place called heaven. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow, though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. I'll tell you something. You'll never get a better invitation than that. God says, come now. Come now. God wants to save you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to prepare you for eternity. This is a sincere plea to a sinful people. Let me ask you in closing, will you accept his invitation tonight? And come to him that you might be saved. Let's sing this lovely hymn in closing. We're going to sing, I hear thy welcome voice that calls me, Lord, to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flowed on Calvary. <laughs> Father, thank you tonight for the ministry and song. Thank you for your word to all our hearts. We pray as God says to each one of us tonight in this building and those sitting at home, come now. We pray that there will be a positive response. Some will say, I am coming, Lord, coming now to thee. Bless our Father this time we have spent together. Thank you for this day, the Lord's Day. Thank you for the youth who will meet now after our meeting. Bless them. 
We pray that you'll undertake for them. We think of Letitia tonight over in Romania. We pray that you'll bless her this week and Woody and Elaine over in the States. Undertake, we pray for them. And undertake for us as we part just now. We give you our heartfelt thanks for the joy of being in your house today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.